Hey gang, Ross Brand here for LivestreamUniverse.com. Welcome to Livestream Stars. It's a special Thursday night edition of Livestream Stars in honor of the new release of Amy Schmidauer's new book, Flog Like a Boss. And so glad to have Amy here before we give her an introduction, although she really doesn't need one. I think everybody watching this probably already knows Amy, but we'll we'll give her one anyway, because that's what you're you're supposed to do. Um, we want to tell you that Livestream Stars is the show where we feature talented broadcasters delivering high quality content across live stream and social video platforms. And it's brought to you by LivestreamUniverse.com. Check it out, LivestreamUniverse.com. We have updates every Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday on our Facebook's, uh, Facebook page. Easy for me to say, Facebook.com slash LivestreamUniverse. Should know it by now. Or just go to RossBrand.live. Facebook is where we do all of our live broadcasts and we put all of our recorded stuff first. And so we're so happy to have Amy joining us. Amy is, as we mentioned, the author of the new book, Vlog Like a Boss. It shows you how to kill it online with video blogging, with strategies and tactics from her years of experience in online video. Amy shares time-tested, proven methods for creating brand awareness with vlogging that will build a loyal community for years to come. You can find out more information at vloglikeaboss.com. And of course, if you tweet about this, definitely use the hashtag vlog like a boss. Amy is a YouTube star and prolific video creator. Her YouTube channel has over 4 million views and contains over 700 videos. Her Savvy Sexy Social Video Series is for people who want to create an amazing brand platform through video and social media. And Amy is also the co-founder of Aftermark, a media company specializing in live video production and interactive content. She's the co-founder along with Vincenzo Landino, who's been a guest on this show a couple times and also co-hosts a live video show called Afterthoughts, which is part of Aftermark. And they do that Thursday afternoons typically. And we want to welcome Amy. Amy, it's so great to have you on. I'm not even sure that we've ever talked before, but I, I feel like I know you from your videos. And, you know, I love the brand that you've built up and it, it's both serious business advice, and it's also fun and a little bit snarky at times. Is that how you got started in vlogging, or was that something that took time to sort of develop a personality and a style of broadcasting that, that works for you? Well, first, let me say thank you for having me on, Ross. I mean, I also feel I know you through your videos, so it's like we've already spoken before. Um, I did not get my start with business advice. I actually started just sort of life casting. Mm -hmm. That was my first venture into the YouTube world. And when you're trying to make a normal day and a normal person's life look interesting on video, you really start to hone in on how to storytell with video. So that's how I got started. It's from that that I learned a lot about community building and sort of social media marketing in general without even really knowing I was becoming a marketer. I was building a community. And local businesses started asking me how I was doing all this stuff online. And they were just trying to wrap their mind around the fact that they needed a Facebook page. And so I started helping people with that. That was what we call now a side hustle. At the time, it was just sort of a passion project in the evenings and weekends. And I was helping businesses in my, in my spare time with their social media on Facebook. When I did that for a little while, I thought, this is something I'm actually really good at. I'm really passionate about it. I went to my first conference and I thought, oh my gosh, this is, this is what I really want to do. I'm on the right track here. That's when I decided to leave my regular job and start on my own. And that's how Savvy Sexy Social came to be. The promise I wanted to make as somebody who wanted to be a thought leader in this space and leverage video to do that was I know how to tell a story with video. So for these businesses who are like wanting to shoot themselves a little bit over the fact that they had to have a Facebook page, they weren't excited about it. They didn't really want to learn about it, but they were Googling for this stuff and trying to figure out how to make it work. I wanted them to Google, find me, get really good right. advice, be able to take action right away, but have fun doing it because this is a space I think we've all learned is a fun uh, place to be if you're doing it the right way and you're trying to relate to people. So the promise I made was I'm going to teach you something about video and social media and you're going to have fun doing it. And that's how I've built an incredible community community over the last five years at Savvy Sexy Social, and that's how we're here today. 
And, you know, it's you, you mentioned it's a fun space. But one thing that, you know, has always impressed me about the way you approach it is you don't you don't make it seem like, oh, join my mastermind group or, you know, subscribe to my videos and yeah. tomorrow you'll be rich, famous and a superstar. Like you've always laid it on the line that this is hard work, that it takes time, that you're not going to be who you're going to become if you actually become good at this in your first two or three or four videos. I mean, I had worked in broadcasting. I was in radio on air for 10 years, and I still look back at my first couple of live videos like, oh, my God. <laughs> right? I mean, like, yeah. I, you know, I, I mean, I, I had never done video before I found Blab. So it was like the whole video side of it. And, you know, I'm totally open about it. Look, no background. No, you yeah. know, I, I, you know, I'm still getting used to this, but it takes time. It takes time. And, and it, it combines, you know, social media, it combines some tech and it combines some broadcasting. And it's not really like if you just know one of those areas, you have the whole, the whole package. How, how long did you feel that it took you to you said, okay, now I'm, I'm really competent at this and I'm starting to really feel like I'm no longer thinking myself through it. I'm now able to really focus mm. on the creating great content without having to focus on all the mechanics of it anymore. I think uh, I think you're you're always thinking about those little things along the way, but I I do think every time you practice meaning publish, you know, every time mm -hmm. you get a a project out there. I published a video. I published a video. It's out there. You're always getting better because you're always getting feedback, especially if you're one of the lucky ones that has an audience and they give you feedback and like you have here. So that's what's really important is I think you get into a flow, you get more confident about how you speak on camera because you're honing in on who you're talking to. And I think that's where the sweet spot is, is when it's no longer this whole, oh, is the camera perfect? Is the situation perfect? And, and, and all of those things. But it's more about, is this the message for my person that needs to hear this right now? And I delivered it to the best of my ability. That's how you know you're you're hitting the ground running and you're you're not worried about the little things as much as you really need to be. And so I think that honestly, I worked through a lot of that in my early years of YouTube. But what the change up was for me was managing who the, my brand as a thought leader would be on the Savvy Sexy Social channel. So those mechanics might have been a little bit in my head for a while. But other than that, I think... Uh, I think as long as you keep your person in mind, and I've been fairly good at that and really focusing on who is getting this message, you're going to be on the right track no matter what else is going on. Right, right. And when you um, started doing videos and you you didn't have fancy equipment, in fact, I think I saw a video just in the time that I kind of came into the video world, right, where you were talking about, like, I don't know if it was an elf camera or it was some sort of little camera you were recording with. You weren't sitting there with a DSLR or a fancy camera or whatever. So if people think that the tools are what they need to get going, you can build an audience with the tools you have, like, a cell phone Absolutely. or a laptop or, you know, a webcam or whatever. Um, so if you don't mind me asking, what are you rocking right now? Like what kind Absolutely. of gear are you using right these days now sure. that you're... Yeah, the last month I we've actually just transitioned over for my, sort of my my easy to carry around vlogging camera is now a, a Sony RX100, which is just a really incredible camera for video. Um, prior to that, I was using Canon G7X, which is also a really great camera, also very portable, um, but it just wasn't quite right with the autofocus for me. So we're on the Sony now. Um, my stand in front of the bookshelf videos are mm -hmm. still used with the Canon 70D, which I really enjoy because I've gotten to a point where I'm semi-confident with a DSLR camera and I can right. go and just hit record and pretty much know where I'm going. And that's also a really nice one for autofocus as well because I'm using external audio. But in the beginning, you know, this is this was crazy town to me. Even mm -hmm. the Sony RX100, I don't know that I would have appreciated it then as much as I do now because I kind of understand what it's actually doing to make my videos better. Initially, I think the first the first camera I was using was a Canon PowerShot because I had it. Like it was okay. just what I had at the 
time, that's what we were taking on vacation with us before the smartphones were smart. And so there was that. And then I bought a Kodak ZI6 and a flip cam. These were the video cameras of the of the day the day that I was, I mean, when was this? 2009, 2008, 2009. So then we know the flip cam, you know, bit the dust because smartphones became so incredible. So getting started today is so much easier than what it was for me then. And even then I had something in the house when I was ready to get started with video. So I really think people overthink the gear. You can go buy all this stuff. You can, you can get the lighting, you can get the mic, you can do all these things, but realistically, you are totally fine starting with the smartphone. The more important thing is appreciating what you have using it and showing yourself you need to upgrade. I will make myself go through pain before I'll buy a piece of equipment to make sure I need it. I'll use it and I'll make sure every dollar is worth it for me. So even that, that came down the ring light, an external microphone, all those things. Just use what you have and show yourself you need to upgrade by actually executing. Because a lot of people go, I'm going to do video, spend $1,000 on equipment, and then don't use it or never learn how to use it properly. And it just sits there and collects dust. And that's just a waste of money. Right, right. Now, let's let's turn to the book because it's quite an accomplishment to get a book done. And how did you get started doing the book? How long did it take you? What was the whole process like? I mean, the very beginning part of this process was simply hearing that people wanted a book from me, which was really fascinating because I make video. So it's like, right, right. what do you mean you want a book? That's crazy. So I, I think that was what it was. But as a speaker, this is actually a really critical component of my process that I'm just now able to have. Being able to stand in front of a room of people who listen to you and want to hear about video, and the same goes for watching on video, that sometimes they'll walk out of the room and say, I really want a next step to take action. So I'm really excited to have a book that I can do that with. But it still took me time to get there because as a communicator, I'm a speaker and I make video and I even podcast, but the written word is not something I'm as practiced in. So just like somebody has to get used to being on video, it takes practice. Same goes for writing a book. So I actually started writing the book at the beginning of 20... What year is it? It's I wrote it at the beginning of 2016. And <laughs> I was trying to write it you know, a little bit every day, but it was so difficult to do that and continue to go about your day as normal and then try to do it again the next morning. It was very broken. So I, did, I didn't like that draft. And I decided to take a, a, a chunk of time off to write it and get it done so that I could do it just laser focused. And that was uh, three weeks that I outlined in August of this past year. And one of those weeks got taken away. Darn it, YouTube YouTube <laughs> called and said, we want you to come to our next stop camp. And I was like, I'm in the middle of writing a book. Okay fine, I'll come. So, but I did have to take the time off to do it. I thought that was the hardest part. It was very hard for me, but uh, man, like putting together a book, it's almost like putting a house together. It's like, you got to pick the windows and you got to pick the paint. You got to do it. It was a lot of work, but I'm just so excited that the baby has been birthed and it's finally here. So nice. Nice. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Um, and, and a big part of what, what you talk about is building your brand, right? And in addition to giving people like great information and sharing your story and how you developed and what people can do as a next step is having a book almost like, you know, now like having a business card or a resume. If you want to be a public speaker or public persona or you're a video creator, if you're somebody who has in sort of the public eye and you want to do any kind of speaking or any, it's almost like you need a book now. Like I'm almost thinking I have to write a book just because, you know, <laughs> it's not enough to have social media. It's not enough to do video. You also need that book. It's like, what, what is this book? Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. We can have him speak at our event or whatever. He's got mm -hmm. a book. <laughs> <laughs> there is something really appealing to this thing. I I used to think of it as sort of a, a big, heavy business card. I do think it's a lot more than that now. But I, I, in some ways, it is that thing that people want to be able to sum you up, and especially in the speaking world. And so I think what a book can do is say, okay, we know that she's got a handle on this because she wrote a book on it. She not only, you know, not only wrote a book, 
there's lots of people writing eBooks. She published a book. Like there's something about like completing that project that I think people want to see. And sometimes as incredible as the internet is, it's always like, oh, well, is it an ebook or is it an internet thing? If you can hold something in your hand, I feel like right. people get a really different feel from it. So yes, I've seen the importance of that as a speaker. And I do think writing a book would be just an incredible experience for anyone. But I don't think you just do it to do it. As a matter of fact, I don't think it's going to, I don't think it's going to do anything to give you notoriety. I honestly, I liked the fact that I wrote it after I was asked for it by a community right. of people, because it essentially was just me giving them what they wanted. And I knew they were going to support me in doing this. And I think it can be frustrating when you're, when you're publishing to no one, much like, much like what people have to go through when they join YouTube for the first time right. and they're, working on that. But I think it could be an amazing process either way. Regardless, jumping into it makes no sense to me. I think preparing for it by actually testing your content wherever you can is huge. Just like I could test a video by simply posting a status update on Facebook to see what kind of engagement I get and how much conversation there is around it. If there's a lot of buzz, I might do a video about that. You could do the same thing about making video about something to see how much conversation there is around it to see if it's worth making a book about. How can you use all of these platforms and the people that you know and the people that support you to say, you should go do that thing? And that's essentially what I did without even knowing I was testing it. I was testing a book this whole time. It just took me publishing 700 videos, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> right. We're talking with Amy Schmidauer, the author of the new book, Vlog Like a Boss. Find out more information at vloglikeaboss.com. What did you learn about yourself going through the process? Oh, I think I think the biggest thing was that I'm pretty spot on about the fact that I need focus. I th I thought that I could manage this in small chunks every day and I'm just not as effective unless I really I really go all in on one thing at a time. And I think multitasking has always been a myth, but um I've learned that more than ever I think with this book. The other thing I think I learned about myself is that there's some pretty incredible people who appreciate the work that I've done. And I don't think I've actually fully realized that until this kind of thing happened, this book. There are some people that I think have always appreciated me and we always talked in comments and we'd have conversations and I'd publish a video and they would watch. And that's a really incredible experience. But I've always chalked that up to the value that I've delivered and like, oh, people love this stuff. I'm going to keep giving them that stuff. I don't think I gave enough credit to the fact that they also love me as well. And so I think that's a really cool thing that I'm kind of figuring out with having a book out is that um, they so love it's, me. They really it's, like me. it's like this relationship. I knew it was there, but I didn't know it was there like at this level. So last night I actually had my first book signing and I just, I think it just like hit me hard because there were people in a room waiting for me to sign a book. And I was like, Oh my gosh, what is going on? And I really, I, when I was asked to speak, I just, I kind of broke down a little bit. So it's really been a, an incredible process. Yeah, we have some great people here. We have uh, Jen Nelson here, Mario Armstrong, who's going to be hosting a groundbreaking show in the whole live streaming awesome. area coming up in April, the Never Settle show. We have uh, Alfredo's here, April's here. Of course, Vincenzo Landino, I think you may know him, is here. Uh, Brad is here, big bad bass man Brad. Um Chris Strove is here, RJ Redden, love everybody stopping by. Please do give us some likes and share it out so that more people can find out about Amy's book. It's Vlog Like a Boss, vloglikeaboss.com, hashtag vlog like a boss. You're seeing it all over the place if you've been on Twitter. And she's a YouTube star. She's got, what, about 4 million views. How how long and and... I mean, obviously, this is what people need to read the book and learn the whole process for. But a little, a little, give us a little taste. What does it take to build a following on YouTube? YouTube is a tough animal for a lot of people to crack, mm. even people who've kind of figured out the social media game and they figured out how to do video on other platforms. YouTube's like a different animal. How, yes. how, how can we up our game? What can we take a, a few things we maybe could take away from this just to start upping our game a little bit on, on YouTube? 
I, I love that you said that because those were the exact words that I said earlier on another interview. Cause it's like YouTube is a really tough animal for people because here's, here's the distinction. We go to Facebook and we can upload a video and that's a, an amazing opportunity that we can do that. And we get views fairly quickly and on YouTube. If you're just getting started and you go and you upload a video, if you have zero subscribers, and no one waiting for your YouTube video, you're not going to get any views. Like That's just how that works. What we forget is what we have done to facilitate relationships on all these social networks, on Instagram, on uh, Facebook, on Twitter, all these places we have been for a long time, some of us longer than others. But even if you're just joining, Facebook has friends for you ready and waiting the moment you join the network. I mean, they just (laughs) somehow know who your friends are already. So with that being known, You sign on, you post a status update, you start conversations. It's not the same thing on YouTube. When you go, you're starting totally fresh. There is a little bit of a lack of that social connection there because you have to upload a video or engage on someone else's video in order to have a conversation with someone. So we we seem to forget that because when you upload a video to Facebook and you see all these views coming in and then you go to YouTube and you got nothing going on, you're like, oh, well, Facebook must be the place to be. Well, obviously, because everyone's hanging out there and that's why we're getting views. So I think people forget that and it's frustrating. But what it takes to be on YouTube is simply the same persistence it took for you to get response to whatever your status updates were on Facebook at the beginning or whatever your tweets were on Twitter at the beginning and being consistent and showing up and engaging with other people. But you also have to create video in order to show up there too. It should be more one of the more prominent users, of course. The average user is just a, a viewer and that's okay. Right. But if you want to post on YouTube, you have to do all of the things that we did when we got started on other social networks as well. When I think about Facebook versus YouTube, it's a hugely different situation. When you go to YouTube to watch a video, whether you're on the platform, you see it on Twitter or social feed, or it came through your email, you're usually looking at a headline and a thumbnail. And that's what you've got to work with. And you choose that video. You press play on that video and the video and the audio come on at the same time because you're in the experience, right? We are on Facebook right now where people are hanging out with their friends and stalking their ex and checking on the kids and see what's going on. And there's ads showing up and group activity and notifications, notifications, notifications. And then all of a sudden your video starts playing in the middle of this stream, but you don't hear us. You just see us talking, right? It's a completely disruptive situation. So we get views based on the fact that it's scrolled by, but it's not an intentional view. It just happened. It was happenstance. That's a good thing because it gives you a chance to pull them in, but you have to pull them in in a different way than you did on YouTube. So people forget that too. You can't repurpose in the way of copy paste in this situation. A YouTube video may or may not be geared for a Facebook audience and vice versa. So how is it that you're appealing to somebody before they see the video to make them come into the video? This is the stuff that people don't consider. Every social network is different context, period. And when you don't consider them that way and you think they're all the same and you just shoot out the video to every single place you're allowed to upload video and try to make it work, it's not going to work. It's just not. You're spreading yourself thin. You're going to be mediocre across the board. And that video might do okay on the network it was made for. That's exactly it. What you just said on the network it's made for. Because I I was thinking about how I used YouTube recently. And um, I basically use YouTube as as an archive, like, you know, you read a book and then you put it on the shelf or you write an article and then you clip it and you put in your clippings in the old days or whatever. So what I do is I do a video for people on Facebook or I do a video for people on another platform. And then I say, okay, I want to save this. So before I file it away in a hard drive somewhere or whatever, upload it to YouTube. And now I know it's always going to be there. And if people want to watch the replay, but um, that's not creating content for a YouTube audience. That is basically having a little portfolio out there so you have a digital footprint. And that's important, too, I think. Absolutely. Because with people, so the, even if you're not getting a lot of views or you're not getting a lot of activity, it's good to have a, a, a nice YouTube channel anyway because people want to do a little digging about you before they work with you or whatever. So they could go to your YouTube channel and watch your videos and say, okay, 
I, I like what this person talks about. They seem knowledgeable, whatever. Maybe I'll, I'll hire them. Maybe I'll, I'll be a client, whatever. And, mm-hmm. and so there is value to that, right? Like in having that digital footprint on Absolutely. YouTube, because I don't think anybody's going to come to a Facebook page and start searching around for videos, but they'll oh find God. your YouTube videos even if you've got five views on them. <laughs> Seriously, G- trying to find a video on Facebook for me is usually a nightmare. I don't even like right. looking at my own Facebook page. I have no idea what's going on. There's just all kinds of things oh, happening. Nice. And I'm like, where's the thing I just posted? I can't even find it. It's it's getting a little frustrating. But yes, YouTube, here's the best part about YouTube is you should leverage it as an archive because it will work hard for you as an archive. Some of my oldest content is bringing in more views than anything else because it's a it's positive in search. It's showing up on the Google front page and it's bringing in that traffic. So in thinking about it like an archive, you know, let's say we're not quite ready to totally embrace YouTube, but we're at least going to leverage it as a place to put what we've already got going on, which is what the average content creator is doing then at least you're dominating your name in search. When someone pulls up your name and your videos on YouTube show up because it's the second largest search engine only to the search engine they're actually using, you know, there you go. Like you've got a really good, a really good sort of chemistry happening there of all of this uh, stuff that you have in your archive. But it's also a great portfolio for you. The bottom line is as a YouTuber, not an archiver, you're going to have to get a little bit more sophisticated than that. You do have to treat YouTube like it's special. And just because you upload content there doesn't mean subscribers are going to come in. Subscribers are going to come in when you give them something compelling to look for and subscribe to. But it can be very powerful as an archive as well. And I don't think people should be ashamed of having a channel with a plethora of videos there that maybe were meant for Snapchat or back in the day we were archiving whatever it was Periscope and Meerkat, right? Well, what do we do with these videos? How do we get them someplace else? How do we keep these forever when they weren't saveable before? Um, There's a way to leverage that and at least dominate how people find you online. But just archiving old content on YouTube is not going to be a way to grow a YouTube channel unless you do something, whether it's changing up the video or doing something specifically around SEO to make it a YouTube worthy project. So we have a question from Anisha, and she's asked, and I, I think I can predict what your answer is, uh, like the, the yes or no part, but the longer answer I think would be instructive to a lot of people. Do you think it's too late to get on YouTube? Can someone start today and still grow uh, in such a crowded market? The answer is it's not too late. And yes, you can start today and grow in a crowded market. I think the the bottom line is it's crowded everywhere. It's not just YouTube. It could be Facebook. It could be Snapchat. It could be any of these things. It's all about how you do it. There's two things to consider. We're all going to different kinds of parties when we go to social media land. You know, there's a Twitter party, there's an Instagram party, there's a Snapchat party, there's a Facebook party, and there's a YouTube party. They're all different parties. You wear something different there. You act different there. You do whatever you got to do to get into the party and fit in, right? So what is that party like? And the only way to find that out is to be an attendee of that party. Hang out on YouTube, find out what people like there, and create content that is contextually going to work there. That's how you attend the party. But then the second thing to consider is how you're going to stand out. And that's what I did when I started my channel. I entered a very crowded space of social media marketers. I guess I was fortunate because it was 2011, but it still was crowded. So I I went into there and I said, how am I going to stand out? I'm going to go to YouTube and I'm going to create content that works on YouTube. People have fun here. It's the home of cat videos. We got to keep it quick. We got to keep it searchable. And that's it. I'm going to put a human face on this thing and we're going to make it fun. So I attended the YouTube party the way I should, but then I allowed my personality to stand out as to why someone would choose me to be their thought leader in that space. And that's how you stand out in a crowded market. You fully embrace who you are and the personality that's going to take you there but you leverage why a social network works. We're not on rented land for our health. We use all these social networks because they attract people that we didn't have to attract there. We just had to go hang out there with them to stand out. And so I think people forget that part. We don't get to go to these social networks and just stand on our soapbox and do whatever we want. There are only certain things that work well on each of these platforms. You have to keep that in mind. 
One of the most fascinating things, actually, I, I've seen was when you do your videos where you you come on live and you actually audit people's YouTube channel right mm-hmm. there for them. Mm-hmm. What what are some? I gotta do more of that lately. I I love that. That. You gotta I'm do more of that. Said that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not my channel, but other people, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or at least give me time Fair. to clean it up a little bit first. But, <laughs> but um, what are what are some of the things that easy easy wins that people can do that most people aren't doing with their YouTube channel? I think one thing is remembering how simple it is, but also the small things make a big difference. A lot of people will upload video to YouTube and then just go get a coffee while it's uploading, right? And that's not a great idea. What you should be doing is thinking about what is the copy that we want here? What's the best headline and the best description? What's the best call to action? Let's make sure that's linked properly. The most important thing people miss, that is a huge, huge missed opportunity, is the custom thumbnail. You get one visual opportunity to pull someone into a YouTube video. So there's a thumbnail that you can design and upload instead of that crazy like facial expression you were making when YouTube automatically generated something for you. So the custom thumbnail is huge. Usually when someone says, oh, I started getting serious about my YouTube channel. I'm using the same one I've always had. Should I go back and delete the old content because it's so bad? And I usually just tell them, is it helping the same cause? Is it helping people? And is it really worth removing if you did the work? If the answer is no, then change the thumbnail. You get to have a new opportunity, a new face of every single video when you make the thumbnails look the way they should. I mean, that's literally the portfolio of of photos that you look at when you go to someone's YouTube channel. So leverage that opportunity. I would also recommend that on that same note, when you when you go to someone's YouTube channel, it should feel like a channel. You know, if you go to Apple TV, you pull up Apple TV and you get all these different rows of things you can do. It's a Netflix and it's a Hulu and it's this, that. And then you click on one and then next it's got recommended content and there's playlists. Well, guess who else has playlists? YouTube. And that's a really great way to design your channel. If you want an example, go to amy.video in your browser and that'll take you to my YouTube channel and you'll see how I have all my playlists laid out. This is essentially choose your own adventure. If you're getting here, then you get to say, oh, what do I want to learn about? I'm going to click on this one. It's going to rip through all of my videos with that common interest. And now you're sort of pulled in. But if I didn't change up my thumbnails and I didn't have playlists to make my channel look inviting and like a place you wanted to hang out, then you probably would come here, not subscribe and leave, which are two things I don't want you to do. So I think those are two huge missed opportunities that uh, people people just don't even think about. They just go, they upload, and then they peace out and let their computer do the rest of the work. And it's like, <laughs> there's so much more to do to make sure we set this right. thing up for success. Uh, Alyssa Payne asks, um, does Periscope have the same type of impact that YouTube does? I, I mean, I think it depends on the individual, obviously, but in terms of maybe in terms of vlogging or in terms of building yeah. your, your your brand. Right. I, I guess I'd be curious to hear what the word impact means to you. But at the same time, I mean, you're using video, you're using video, you're using video, period. So YouTube for on a longevity situation is going to be much better if you build your archives because old videos can work for you in the long run with search and referred content. But Periscope is very powerful as well, especially if you have a Twitter following that's hanging out there, then you can get your video playing in the feed real time. And that's really powerful as well. So if you're just trying to reach people with video and Periscope and Twitter is a really great place for your face to be, then that's going to have huge impact. YouTube is going to have more impact for me because I have a subscribership there, but I also have other networks I can leverage to push push people there. So, And then you can do the same thing with Periscope. You can push people from other places to Periscope and get them to engage with you there. I I think it can have great impact. And the other thing is people constantly thinking I need to be in all places. You can live stream on every single network, or you could focus on one. And this goes back to the original conversation I think we were having. But if you want people to watch you on Periscope, but maybe you're seeing more traction in other places, but you still feel like Periscope is going to be your home base, then tell people to go to Periscope. People <laughs> act like this is like rocket science. It's not. You should put 
your attention on the space where you want momentum. That's mm -hmm. how people get featured on social networks. That's how you get more traffic because you didn't say, I'm going to be in all places. You said, I'm going to go hard on this place and send all the attention I can there. Right. That's why my YouTube videos absolutely must, without a doubt, live on YouTube for a minimum of 24 to 48 hours before I will point them anywhere else. Okay, fine. Let's upload it to Facebook now if it works. But first, we go to YouTube and we find out how successful this piece, piece of content is going to be by focusing all the attention there. Right. And then we can spread the love around. But a lot of people will just be sort of mediocre, pop on Periscope, not tell anyone to go there. Maybe they'll also turn on Facebook and all the other things you can do now and, and try to be all things to all people instead of getting their people focused on where they want to be. We're talking with Amy Schmenauer, the author of the new book, Vlog Like a Boss, How to Kill It Online <laughs> with Video. Um, did I get the uh, second part there right? I always do this stuff off yeah. the top of my head. Okay. Yeah, video blogging. You left off video the blogging. Video blogging, yes. That's <laughs> blogging, video blogging. So oh, what, what, that, what that leads me to is um, when you do the video, right, and you're, you're in that first 24, 48 hours seeing how that content is going to play out, have you already embedded it in, on, your, on your website and, and put a blog post around it? I mean, are you driving people to watch it on your blog? from the first moment that you post it? No. Okay. In a perfect world, the video is embedded there. But mm -hmm. I don't always get that far in the workflow because I spend so much time on the thumbnail and the SEO and the YouTube backend. See, now I feel but, better because I'm always behind on that. Too. I know, I know. Again, I'm not. I, the blogging ends up falling behind for me a little bit. But the key reason why it's okay for me to tell myself that it's okay is because YouTube wants to make money. So... If I want YouTube to make money so that they'll send me more traffic, I need to respect the process. So I'm going to send you to YouTube to watch that video. That's going to be where they make the most money on ads. That's where they're more likely to get you to watch more content. If you watch the video on my channel, they're relying on whatever is referred at the end of that video embedded in the blog post for you to continue watching, which is not as high a likelihood as someone being on youtube.com clicking to watch a video. So I started their session. So YouTube's like, go Amy, thanks for bringing people to the platform. And then they watch another video. It could be my video or someone else's video. It doesn't matter. YouTube is happy I brought them there because on average, viewers are watching video on YouTube on their mobile for 40 minutes. Right. So if I get you hooked on one, you might be there for 40 minutes and YouTube makes money there. That's why the first couple of days where, where YouTube is trying to find out how important this video is to them, is important for me to push them to where they need to be, YouTube. Right. And right. then after some time, you know, we might upload the video to Facebook. I'll send you to the blog post where I might have added information and links and things like that. That's where it makes sense for me to continue to reap benefits in terms of traffic and making leads and things that didn't convert from just the YouTube video, but now we can convert right. from the blog post. Don't be afraid to keep marketing the video, but remember where it needs to be to get the most momentum. I would say the same thing about a Facebook video. You might be able to embed it, but why wouldn't you push somebody to the Facebook link when a live video specifically a live video or or um i think i just froze or my i think you did too happen. but um, the first 24 hours of a facebook video is so important you should push people there let me do you want to refresh I'm afraid to, I'm afraid to leave and come back because last time that didn't work but i will try okay so while we wait for amy i uh, just want to say a quick hello chocolate johnny is here john capos thanks for joining us john when amy comes back and Looks like she should be back momentarily. We'll get your question in there. Um, well, I hope Amy can make it back in. Well, it's a great time to tell you about Summit Live. <laughs> if you haven't gotten your tickets yet for Summit Live, go to LivestreamUniverse.com, LivestreamUniverse.com, and enter the promo code Ross Brand to save 20%. You can save 20% on your Summit Live tickets. Uh, go to LivestreamUniverse.com again. Click the image that shows Summit Live. I'll be speaking there. And uh, just click that that banner, and you can save 20% on your tickets to Summit Live by using the promo code Ross Brand. So while we wait for Amy to get back in, we will tell you that her book is Vlog Like a Boss. You can find out more information at vloglikeaboss.com. Amy's also a co-founder of Aftermark. And you can find more information about Aftermark at aftermark.com. 
And uh, we're just talking about Amy's new book. She's a YouTube star, got over 4 million, 4 million views on her YouTube channel. She hosts Savvy Sexy Social, and she has over 700 videos. I mean, that's pretty impressive. 700 videos on her channel. I'm just looking now. Um, you, 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 she breaks it down into categories, too. So you have a uh, beginner's guide to vlogging, vlog like a boss, musical book reviews. <laughs> she did musical book reviews. And she talks about this in the intro to the book. She did a jab, 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 right hook review to the song uh, Mar uh, Mar Mariah Carey's Christmas song. She did a parody as a book review. She also did a book review to a Justin Bieber song <laughs> for Ask Gary V. So. Uh, hopefully Amy can get back in here. Just a great conversation with her about how to do video. Um, if you have any questions that you'd like Amy to answer, please do throw them in the chat and we'd be happy to ask them. Uh, hopefully we can get Amy back in. Um, otherwise we'll need to start a new, uh, a new broadcast if we can't get Amy back in, but we really appreciate her spending time with us. The book was released just a couple of days ago, and um, it seems to be doing really well based on all. It's not bringing your camera back in. Uh, do you want to, should we, let's see if we should try and create a new, do we create a new uh, broadcast? Let me just type that in and ask Amy. We should create a new broadcast. Um, I don't know why it won't let you in. I don't have the power over that. Thanks, everybody, for hanging in with us. Um, we're going to get this resolved in just a moment. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a new broadcast for this. It'll be on the Livestream Universe Facebook page. Just go to rossbrand.live, rossbrand.live. We're going to end this broadcast and create a brand new broadcast and invite Amy into that broadcast, okay? We will be back in just a minute. Thanks, guys.